Well, thank you very much uh, for having me. I should warn you ahead of time that I'm going to talk here mostly as a historian and not as a numismatist. So I'll be broad, but not deep. Um, this actually, wait a second. Right. Um, this has grown out of my uh, engagement for the last 15 years or so uh, with the comparative history of East and West in ancient Eurasia, comparing in particular the Roman Empire and the Han Empire. And part of this comparison involved coinage. And I think comparison is really important. It's important for a number of reasons. One is that it makes the familiar, the things, everybody is in some ways an expert. And in a way, comparison, uh, the wider it is, the better, defamiliarizes the familiar. Because you look at the things you already think you know, and you realize things turn out very differently in different parts of the world. And you start wondering why that might be. And once you start wondering about this, you went into the issue of causation. And I, I'm actually a bit, bit of a purist on this. I think it's almost impossible to make any kind of causal claim without engaging at least implicitly in comparison or counterfactual reasoning. Because if you want to know why things turned out a certain way in one part of the world, what have we due to a number of factors? Do you find similar factors in a different part of the world with the same or different outcomes? And once you get into this, uh, you're already much closer to a more systematic understanding of how why things got to be the way they are. Now, in ancient history, one of the big problems is the problem of small sample size. So if you compare Rome and ancient China, you have a sample of two, which is the absolute <laughs> minimum number you need for any kind of comparison. And more often than not, it, that's pretty much it. And that's, that's a real problem. If you had 20 independent uh, traditions of coinage in the world, fully independent, we could go about uh, comparison uh, in a much more systematic way, but we can't. Because arguably, that's still arguable, but I just put it on the slide, there were really only two fully independent numismatic uh, traditions in the world, both of them in the old world, as it happens, what I call the Aegean currency system that grows out of Lydia, uh, Ionia, the Aegean in 7th century BC or thereabouts, and spreads very widely uh, across most of the old world. And then on the right hand side of the slide, the Chinese or East Asian uh, currency system uh, that developed very independently. It's very much, I believe, still an open question whether India or South Asia ever developed a fully independent currency tradition. I have no dog in this fight. I have no strong views on this matter. Um, it doesn't ultimately matter all that much because India is eventually absorbed into uh, the Aegean currency zone. So from my, from my perspective, it doesn't make a huge difference, whereas China is not, or at least not until the late 19th century, which is very uh, recently, indeed. Now, what does the Aegean currency system look like? I'm not going to bore you uh, with things everybody in the room already knows. I just want to make a very simple point, which is that the Aegean tradition spreads very widely uh, in, in, in lots of cases where this dissemination is not backed up by political domination. The fact that people in pre-Roman Britain or in Ethiopia or in India uh, produce coins that look very much like, well, sort of very much like um, early Aegean coins is not a function of incorporation into some larger empire being ruled by the Greeks or the Macedonians. In some cases, that's the case, but it doesn't have to be. So it's a, it, it's, it's a template that seems to appeal to a lot of people for any number of reasons. That you have coins that are round, they have uh, pictorial images on them, and usually, not always, but often, some kind of writing. That seems to be a template that travels extremely well. And it's not terribly difficult to understand why that would be. People like images. If they, are, if they are literate societies, they like writing uh, the round form. That's a bit, perhaps, uh, not so much a given. But y you can see how this would be a marketable uh, kind of template. The template doesn't really change all that much over time. From almost the very beginning, you have some kind of image, uh, some kind of writing. It can be very elaborate. It can be very nice looking. But it has, doesn't have to be made by people in the Aegean. It can be made by people somewhere else. You have various spin-offs, the Achaemenid coinage, uh, the Greco-Bactrian coins, the Greco-Indian coins. They are square. That's unusual, but they're ultimately the same kind of coin. You have an image in the middle and a legend around it. The Roman uh, bronze coins. 
if you want to call it coinage, that's a bit of an outlier too, but eventually even the Romans are absorbed into the system and they end up with a very systematic version of the Aegean currency system and it's still with us uh, even in the US today. We may get rid of cash at some point like people in Sweden are trying to do, that would be the end of that system, but so far it's very much alive and well and covers the entire globe. So that's a very successful system and it's not always backed up by a political power. That makes the fact that there was a fully independent currency system out there all the more uh, remarkable. That's the Chinese currency system that goes back about three and a half thousand years. Uh, the earliest manifestations that we have of this are, um, are cowries that are, as far as we can tell, were imported from the Indian Ocean at quite some remove, not necessarily even by sea, but maybe across the mountains of Burma and Yunnan. Uh, these objects are very frequently found in Yunnan, which is the mountainous southernmost part of China, so it must have been quite an effort uh, to get them there. Uh, they're used from about the middle of the second, uh, second millennium BC onwards, the Shang Dynasty and the, uh, the Western Zhou. Um, they are often found in this particular way that the little hole is pierced in one part of the cower and they are strung up on strings of ten uh, to turn them into more standardized monetary units. Before long, of course, the Chinese uh, also manufacture in large quantities a uh, uh, bronze uh, imitation uh, cowries from the end of the second millennium BC onwards, which must have been much easier to do than import real cowries uh, from far away. That's a very popular uh, means of um, a payment, it seems, for much of the first millennium BC. Well, eventually, you get the famous uh, tool uh, money, um, monetary objects, I'm not going to call them coins, but monetary objects that are shaped like miniaturized versions of tools. The dominant shape, of course, is the blade of the spade. They start out pretty, pretty large. They are three or four inches long. They weigh 20, 30 grams. I uh, never really quite learned what ounces are, so I'm going to use grams uh, in my talk. Uh, they shrink over time down to maybe five, six, seven grams. So they're about the weight of a standard, you know, Greek or Roman uh, coin, uh, roughly speaking. They become more stylized uh, in shape, but they retain uh, their form. They seem to be increasingly manufactured not by private individuals or local uh, elites, but by actual states, especially in the early in the spring and autumn and early warring states period around the middle of the first millennium uh, BC. Writing appears on them from about the 7th century BC onwards. Um, the earliest uh, characters are simply claiming that they are cowries. So they are clearly meant to be a substitute for the earlier uh, cowrie well, not coinage, but uh, monetary uh, system. Um, the second variety are the knife coins that are more common in the northern reaches of China. They undergo the same evolution. They start out pretty big and get smaller, almost like large razor blades uh, over time, uh, inscribed uh, initially with the cowrie symbol and then the names of the capital cities of the various states. This shows the distribution of this uh, in the central plain region here on the uh, lower uh, yellow river basin where most people who live in China at the time uh, live. Uh, that's where the, the spade coins uh, come from, the knife coins are more common in the northern periphery of China and there's a separate zone on the lower Yangtze River which I'll get to in a moment. Round coins that look more like quote unquote real coins, western style coins, appear in the 4th century uh, BC. Now if you look at them you might think, well 4th century BC, maybe there's some kind of influence of the Aegean uh, tradition, there's certainly already trade routes, contacts um, um, in place and had been for a long time, but it doesn't really seem to be the case. Uh, the template for these bronze coins appears to be uh, the jade discs. If you go into any museum and look at the Chinese collections, you will find large numbers of these jade discs. Uh, they vary hugely in size. One can be like small wheels. The smallest ones really the size more or less of these early coins. Uh, they are found in abundance in early tombs. They're very valuable. They're difficult to manufacture because jade is a hard um, uh, material to, to work on. But if you put them side by side, they are really identical. So the most economic explanation is um, <coughs> the warring states in the 4th century BC come up with this particular format of coin modeled uh, on these jade discs uh, known as B. 
Um, they do not carry any pictorial images. Um, the, the ideograms that appear on them are usually the name of the capital city or some other major city in one of the seven warring states in the fourth or third century uh, BC, presumably where they were being uh, issued. They become uh, they started being relatively varied initially from about 300 BC onwards to become very uniform within the individual states, which indicates that the state takes over uh, manufacture of these coins. They are produced on a certain size and weight standard that is consistent within a given state, but varies between states. So there's a fair amount of authority being exercised in that regard. Most famous specimen are the coins issued uh, by the state of Jin, uh, which eventually takes over all of China, the so-called Ban Liang, the half ounce coins. So Liang, my Chinese pronunciation is terrible, so you have to just bear with that. Uh, Liang is an ancient Chinese ounce of about 16 grams, and a half ounce coin weighed um, 8 grams. And in fact, the early uh, Ban Liang coins do weigh, tend to weigh around 8 grams, so they are properly uh, named. They do get lighter over time as uh, Jin needs to um, increase its um, expenditure. And of course, there are two symbols on them saying Ban Liang, half ounce uh, coin. Now, what happens eventually is that the state of Jin in the course of the third century BC takes over all of what was then China, uh, broadly speaking, uh, establishing the first unified empire, the first emperor of terracotta army fame. That goes down, is replaced by the Han dynasty that rules core China for more than 400 years. And that's when the monetary tradition really becomes uh, canonical, it becomes solidified um, in, in that period. For the first century or so of Han rule, uh, much of the second century BC, the state retreats from coin production, uh, probably in response to the very centralized autocratic regime of the Jin state. There's a lot of private minting, private individuals are allowed to mint their own coins. There's an enormous variety of uh, weights and measures and so on. They're all um, appear in the same format. They're still round coins with a square hole, but they vary hugely in uh, um, size, weight, and fineness. Uh, this lasts till the end of the second century BC in the 110s, the, the martial emperor, the emperor Wu, who has to fund very big wars against the Xiongnu, the steppe uh, people in the north, decides to re-centralize. Um, he imposes any number, implements a number of centralizing reforms, among which is a reform of the coinage. The idea being that from now on, the state should be the only authority empowered to issue coins, and all coins should ideally look exactly the same. This is the birth of the Wuzhu coin, the five grain coin, which weighs five grains. It's about 3.2, 3.3 grams, made of uh, bronze with a very small admixture of lead, carrying the two characters, Wuzhu, five grains. And there, again, there's no pictorial image and no writing on the inverse. Uh, these coins are churned out in very large quantities. About 28 billion of them are made in the following century, according to the Han Shu, the standard history of the Western Han period, even more in later uh, periods. This becomes the dominant form of coinage in China for a very long time indeed. Uh, when uh, the Tang Dynasty um, succeeds eventually in the early 7th century BC, uh, AD, sorry, they deliberately go back to this format. They issue a coin, it looks very much like the Han Wuzhu coin. It has four characters, it's more wordy uh, than the old one. It says inaugural currency, you need four symbols to express this instead of two, but it's ultimately the same kind of coin. Song Dynasty from 960 onwards, same kind of thing. Six characters instead of uh, four, uh, two on the, uh, uh, in, in the back. Uh, there's more variation in terms of what these characters say, but it's ultimately the same for, uh, format. And it continues really all the way up to the 19th century, when Western-style coins appear for the first time. So the system is extremely resilient, and it always tends to bounce back after periods of effective demonetization in some of the interstitial periods in between um, dynasties. So. What's missing from this picture, of course, is precious metal coins, right? If you look at the Aegean traditions, the early Greek coins are made of, well, silver and then augmented by gold, the Romans and so on. Um, that doesn't really happen um, in China. 
There's only early on one um, tradition, one currency tradition that is uh, fairly independent even within this larger region. It is sustained by a single uh, one of the seven major warring states, the states of Sh the state of Shu in the southern central uh, Yangtze uh, Basin, one of the main rivals of Jin for supremacy in China. What the people in Shu do is they produce these objects. Uh, they're little uh, rectangular gold plates that are parts of larger sheets that are stamped. So you cast it and you stamp it. The sheets can be up to 24 uh, plates big and you can break or cut off individual bits or strips of these uh, platelets or rectangles as desired. There's a great deal of variation in terms of size and weight. On average, one of these rectangles would be about 15 grams of gold. That's maybe about twice as much as a Roman aureus. That's a pretty sizable gold coin um, equivalent. So it wouldn't have been terribly useful in everyday transactions. It would have been more useful uh, for use at the elite level. What is striking about this, though, is that these objects are found mostly in hordes and not in tombs. Now, much of what you see in museums uh, comes out of tombs, but not everything. And the fact that these things are mostly found in hordes is significant because it suggests it wasn't just manufactured for funerary purposes, just to be buried in the ground. Some people would actually use these objects in actual transactions. It had to be at the elite level because most ordinary people couldn't even afford to have one of these things. But there was some practical use uh, for these objects. In daily life, they were augmented by what is called the ant nose uh, coins, which is a highly stylized form of the earlier cowries, effectively. Uh, it's little lumps of bronze uh, that would play the same role as the small bronze coins would in the other warring states. So that's a genuinely different tradition that in terms of value, it seems to have been anchored in gold rather than in bronze. This is comprehensively co suppressed uh, when the state of Jin uh, conquers uh, a shoe in the late 3rd century BC. These objects disappear and are never uh, heard of um, again. Um, later dynasties, people talk about the stuff. They will be found by people in the fields and that sort of thing. But uh, this tradition comes to a very sudden end and is never uh, revived. Now, of course, there is still gold and silver in China. What you see in the Han period, when the, 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 the standard uh, bronze coin becomes the absolute norm, there is some use of gold. Now gold appears in a very different uh, format, in the form of hoof-shaped um, gold uh, objects, horse hoof gold that sort of looks like a horse hoof, if you have some imagination, um, objects that are hollow on the inside, um, that's a better picture. That's what you can't see, they're hollow, but you see what they look like on the outside. And also deer hoof uh, shape, uh, shaped uh, golden objects that are slimmer. I guess a deer hoof looks uh, like this. They're also hollow um, on the inside. In fact, these are pictures from a very big exhibition uh, in Beijing that I saw a couple of years ago uh, where hundreds of these objects were displayed. They came from the tomb of a Han noble from, I think, the late 2nd century BC, a lesser member of the imperial family who was buried with an absolutely staggering amount of stuff, including uh, lots and lots of these gold objects. Uh, most of the ones we know come from a very few finds in very high-end tombs of people associated with the upper echelon uh, of the ruling class, and then there's a smattering of finds uh, from other locations. So ownership of these things seems to have been very strongly concentrated at the very top of society. Um, what you also find in these tombs, or at least in this tomb, is gold objects that look almost like coins. Uh, in fact, they remind me of the Celtic uh, gold coins that you find in southern Germany and Bohemia, but they weren't really meant to be golds. They're only found in tombs, very rarely. As far as I know, they're never mentioned in literary texts, far what I've seen in the secondary literature, and they're clearly manufactured specifically just as grave goods. If you're at the very top of society, you may be buried with some of these objects. Uh, the horse hoof, the deer hoof uh, gold, I can't call them coins, but coin-like objects. Uh, they are used in different contexts. Very broadly speaking, they come in two flavors. Uh, one is um, objects that are uh, inscribed with a single character that means pound. And those 
items tend to weigh more or less, very broadly speaking, uh, one ancient uh, Chinese pound, which is about 250 grams, quarter of a kilo. And then there are plenty of unmarked ones, and the unmarked ones tend to be all over the place. They can be much lighter and also much heavier, up to a kilo or more. In some cases, they can be cut up, sliced up into two or more pieces. So we don't really know what this means because the sources don't explain it to us. It seems reasonable to conjecture that the inscribed objects are ones that are more likely to have been used in actual transactions. Uh, the Han Shu, the Huan Shu, the standard histories talk about this at some length, are uh, claiming that the emperor would make gifts to members of the elite and nobility generals in the form of those gold objects that the nobility owed a special kind of tribute to the emperor in the form of those gold objects. People would hold it as a store of wealth. So there was some practical use uh, for these objects. The uninscribed ones maybe were more primarily or exclusively used in a funerary context. We simply don't know. We can only infer this uh, from the context. So there is gold out there, not in very large quantities, but uh, not insignificant either. There's hardly any silver in the Han period, or later periods occasionally find very slim silver um, so rectangles, again in funerary context, they're hardly ever mentioned in the literary tradition. There's virtually no silver in circulation, it seems, in this uh, period in time. Another thing that's striking is that those objects seem to have been treated as commodities. Uh, notwithstanding of what we would f often read in the secondary literature, that does not seem to have been an actual fixed exchange rate between these gold objects and the bronze coins. It wasn't that a particular amount of gold, uh, gold was equivalent to this many thousands of uh, bronze coins. There are different um, valuations recorded, not just in literary text, but in documentary text, in the bamboo and wooden slips that have survived in, in large quantities and now being added in increasing quantities. Um, the valuation seems to have varied by a factor of two or three over the course of several centuries. So this is not a, a stable uh, currency system. Uh, it is really very much anchored in the bronze coinage that is the basis of everything. And then these gold objects that are more or less standardized a very in wealth relative to this baseline uh, base metal coinage. And use of these objects must have been limited de facto uh, to very elevated elite circles. Now, this raises a number of questions. Uh, why did the uh, initial tradition of manufacturing significantly small and more useful gold objects not continue after uh, the third century BC? Was that just a function of political change that Jin won and the state of Shu uh, lost? That's probably part of the explanation. I think there's a better explanation, which is rooted in uh, supply. There's a very strong argument to be made that the Chinese, ancient Chinese currency system and subsequent currency systems up to the 16th century were very heavily constrained by a relative scarcity of gold and especially silver uh, in China, or those parts of China that were actually accessible uh, to the major dynasties, certainly compared to what we see in the West, let's say in the Roman Empire. Precision is impossible, but we do have some figures from by Elder Pliny and other sources talking about the output uh, of the Spanish and other silver and gold mines uh, in, in the early Roman Empire. There are tons and tons of gold and silver churned up year after year. We can compare this uh, to figures in China, which even in very good and very productive times are much lower than what you get in the case of the Roman Empire, both for silver and also for gold. That's not really surprising because uh, thanks to a standard survey of mining in China, we know where gold and silver mines were located historically. Uh, in China, this is a map of all the known historical gold mines in China. You see they're concentrated here in the mountainous uh, western uh, periphery of core China. Very few of these mines were actually are known to have been in operation in antiquity in the Han period. In fact, most of the gold that, that is being produced in this period is uh, sort of sifted uh, out of rivers. It's not actually mined uh, out of mountains. And that's how the state of Shu uh, um, uh, was able to manufacture these gold platelets because it's relatively speaking the most gold-rich region uh, in core China. Silver is even worse. 
Uh, silver mines are concentrated very heavily in the southern periphery of China, which is nominally ruled by the Han and the Tang, but not very well uh, developed in these early periods. None of those mines are known to have been uh, active in antiquity. Very few in the far south uh, west, the very periphery of the Han Empire. And most of the silver that was being produced was produced as a side product of the smelting of other metals. So there was really not much actual silver mining going on in this period, which accounts for the dramatic scarcity of silver uh, for a very long time, for over a thousand years uh, of imperial Chinese history. Um, so it seems that a lack of supply really made a very big um, difference. It's not that the Chinese didn't like golden metal. When New World silver became available in the late 16th century, the 17th century, the Spanish shipped about 7,000 tons of silver across the Pacific, selling it uh, to the Chinese. Chinese were very eager to silverize their economy in the late Ming period. That's a very strong circumstantial argument in favor of the view that it was really supply constraints early on uh, that uh, limited what could be done uh, on the ground. So metal supply is something that really matters on the supply side. And it's not limited to China. If you think of other currency systems, um, well, the Greeks had lots of silver coins because there were lots of silver mines in Attica and Thasos, but not that many gold mines. Romans had more gold because they got gold out of Spain and Bosnia and Dacia and those places. There was always more gold in India. Uh, than in other parts of the old world. That's why gold is worth less compared to silver. There are more gold coins. There was a boost, a boom in, in gold coinage in the early Middle Ages with deposits coming out of North Africa. There was this new world silver in the early modern period, um, then succeeded by Brazilian gold later on. And you can see how changes in supply very much affect uh, what kinds of coins are being struck in large quantities. So that arguably also held true for China. There just isn't enough gold and silver around to maintain a regular gold and silver coinage system. Yes, they could have manufactured those coins, but it would have been very valuable because of the scarcity of the material and therefore not terribly uh, useful. And if you are very, very rich, you don't need those coins. You can actually use these horse hoof and deer hoof uh, uh, gold objects that I showed you earlier. Another argument focuses on demand. Maybe there were structural differences in demand for lightweight, small scale, relatively high, but not too high value objects uh, between East and West, say the Mediterranean and China in antiquity. That really does seem to have been the case. Now, I don't claim to know why the Greeks first invented uh, coinage, uh, but it's pretty clear that at some point, the military dimension is really significant. Once you think of the Hellenistic expansion uh, of coin use, Carthaginians minting coins in uh, Sicily, the Romans uh, adopting silver coinage, many other examples. That's very much driven by fiscal and military considerations. The need to be able to transfer normed units of considerable but not too large value uh, to individuals, which is very well done by means of silver coinage in particular. This need is, as far as we can tell, absent from ancient China. In the Warring States period, 5th, 4th, 3rd centuries BC, the Warring States wage very large wars. They have huge infantry armies, hundreds of thousands of people, if the sources are to be believed, but they're not usually paid in cash. Uh, they are given food to keep them uh, going, and they're issued weaponry centrally manufactured in state-owned workshops and then kept in large uh, magazines. So there was really no need uh, for cash uh, payments to the military, maybe to officers, but that's, uh, we don't even hear about that. In the Han period, this uh, tradition continues, a lot of conscription in the last two centuries um, AD, then a BC, sorry, then a transition to other forms of recruitment, but not normally involving uh, cash. There's a great deal of coercion, uh, we have lots of documents from the northern frontier, from Inner Mongolia, Gansu, wooden bamboo strips surviving in a very arid climate, telling us how soldiers at the frontier were compensated. They were given large amounts of grain, some other basic foodstuffs, but no money. Only officers appear to have been paid in money, um, if at all. That continues in later dynasties, in the Tang dynasty, you have hundreds of thousands of soldiers who are given land, and they're supposed to farm the land, feed themselves, and fight in their spare time. 
It's not till the Song period that you have a very large army that needs to be paid in cash. And that's exactly when you have a huge expansion in uh, the, the production of devalued uh, bronze coins and a greater transition to paper money because the system could not want to support uh, these kinds of payments. So that seems to have played a significant role as well. It's certainly those two factors together on the supply side, on the demand side, explain why, help explain, allow us to explain why gold, silver coins are so much more frequent, why they are the anchor of the currency system in large parts of Eurasia, but not uh, in East Asia, uh, because there's far less supply and far less demand. What those, what those two factors taken together cannot explain is why there are no gold and silver coins in China, right? Because you could say, okay, there isn't enough gold, there isn't enough silver, there isn't much demand, but there are coins. So why didn't they manufacture a few gold coins and a few silver coins? And they would talk about it and we would find them in the tombs or somewhere in the archaeological record. That cannot be explained with reference to those two factors. So we have to bring in some other uh, feature which has to be rooted one way or another in politics or culture. There had to be a deliberate decision made by the authorities not to engage in this particular kind of activity to make bronze coins normative to the exclusion of precious metal coinage. Now, unfortunately, as far as I know, nobody ever talked explicitly about this, i.e. the sources we have, the textual sources, don't say the government decided not to make those things because it was considered to be a bad thing. That doesn't really happen. We have some indications, uh, the best of which comes out of a text in the Han Shu uh, dating to the early 2nd uh, century BC, a memorial submitted to the imperial court. We don't know how authentic these things are. They could be made up or rewritten uh, at later stages, but at least they give you some insight into the mind of upper class uh, Chinese at the time. The idea being expressed here, it's a discussion about uh, monetary arrangements in general. The idea being, it's really not a very good idea to have ordinary people, or anybody really, access to objects that are small, lightweight, and very valuable, like jewelry, pearls, jade, gold, and silver. They are small, they are light, they're easy to hide. Uh, people may get the wrong ideas if they have access to those uh, means of storing uh, wealth, of engaging into transactions. They're easy to hide, that's a problem, because officials are corrupt, they can hide their wealth they can move things around. If your wealth is stored in bronze coins, on strings of a thousand bronze coins, you need five trucks, basically, to move your fortune from one point to another. If it's in gold, that's much easier um, to do. And all these uh, insinuations that this would give people unwelcome autonomy and independence. And I think that's a, that may not be representative, we don't know, but it's sort of meaningful in light of some of the scholarship we have now, thanks to Leslie Kirk and others, on the, uh, what Greek coinage did early on, right? The moment you have silver coins in the context of the polis, it allows ordinary people to participate in transactional networks that used to be confined to elites who would exchange tripods and all kinds of uh, recondite objects. It would democratize uh, the use of normed uh, items that represented value. It would empower uh, ordinary people. It would make them more autonomous, more independent, which makes a lot of sense if you live in a Greek polis. That's a very desirable outcome. It doesn't make much sense at all if you live in Han China, an empire of 50 million people with a centralized government that struggles to maintain control over a very far-flung and dispersed uh, population. That was not a popular uh, theme at the time. So there seems to be a political calculus involved in uh, trying to keep this from happening. We also know from the standard histories that making coins out of gold and silver was explicitly considered to be a feature of the barbarians, a very weird one. So we have descriptions of the Parthians and the Romans, the Chinese know very little about, and they make these laundry lists of weird things that remote barbarians do. And one of those weird things was they have coins made of gold and silver that was considered worth noting, right? That's what they do implicitly, that's what we don't do because they are just really uh, different. 
What's striking here is what happens in a contact zone, like uh, Xinjiang, where the Aegean and the East Asian monetary systems meet and, in effect, um, overlap. What can happen in this kind of contact zone is that you have hybrid issues. Very few of these specimens have come to light. It's some kind of mongrel version of Hellenistic uh, coinage. We have some kind of portrait, a fake legend that doesn't actually mean anything on one side, and a dragon uh, as a concession to China uh, on the other side. Now, dragons are very popular in Chinese art. If you go to any museum and look at any collection of ancient Chinese art full of dragons, there are no dragons ever on Chinese coins because there are no pictures whatsoever on ancient Chinese or any Chinese uh, coins. In this frontier, this contact zone, people think, well, we are basically using the Aegean tradition, but we have to also recognize China. But we do it in a very unusual way. We put on uh, these dragons. This object would not have been recognized as legal tender, as we would put it, in China proper. That's a fair guess to make. In fact, when Western-style coins entered China, Roman gold coins, Sasanian coins that entered China by way of uh, trade, they are effectively demonetized. They're not used as money. They are usually get little holes punched into them, and they are strung up and used as jewelry. So they are perceived to be valuable because they're made of gold and silver, but they are not used um, as money. So there is a, a clear barrier uh, uh, already there <coughs> early on in antiquity uh, to this kind of tradition. And in fact, once silver reaches China in the 16th, in the 17th century via the Spanish from the New World, and all of a sudden there are literally thousands of tons of silver sloshing through the uh, Chinese system, they still don't make any coins. Um, then they uh, produce these boat-shaped uh, silver ingots, which are not terribly different from the earlier Han gold uh, hoof um, items that I showed you earlier. The economy is put on a silver basis, but still there are no silver coins. Of course, at that point in the, in the Ming Dynasty, the system had been in place for 2,000 years. And we know that successive Chinese dynasties increasingly legitimate their own rule, their own existence, by actively going back to the old Han tradition in trying to restore with minimal adaptation institutions, symbols that were in use already in antiquity. And the Ming dynasty was particularly uh, keen on this. That's the dynasty that kicks out the Mongols, restores a proper uh, Chinese regime in China, and has zero interest in deviating even one inch uh, from this ancient tradition. So by then, the path dependence had become extremely uh, powerful and, and kept any kind of major innovations uh, from being made. So on the other hand, if you are within the orbit of Chinese culture, if you're in Japan or in Vietnam, you are going to adopt uh, the Chinese template. The earliest coined money that appears in, in Japan around 700 AD is effectively Chinese money. And the same is true of at least uh, northern Vietnam. So you are either part of the Chinese culture sphere, then this is what you do, or you're not. And if you're not, uh, then uh, your issues are not going to be either used or imitated in China itself. And that becomes a very, very powerful, resilient uh, tradition. Now, this brings me to my final point, which is the question of how these objects were valued, whether there are systematic differences in valuing um, um, uh, predominantly bronze coins in China and precious metal coins in other parts of the old world. Uh, there is a tradition out there in modern scholarship, I should say, well, both in, in the sources, but especially in modern scholarship, that draws some kind of contrast between the West and the East with respect to why coins were considered to be valuable, why they were uh, thought to have uh, embody some uh, measure of value. The idea being that in the West, in the Mediterranean, in Europe, in the Middle East, where we look, uh, coins are valued primarily, not exclusively, but primarily, uh, thanks to their intrinsic value, the amount of gold and silver that they contain, whereas in China you have a more nominalist, a more shuttleist tradition, where coins are being valued at a certain rate because someone says so, because the state says this coin is worth this much, please accept it at this uh, value. Now, that certainly receives some support from textual sources. Uh, all kinds of observations from ancient Chinese sources 
Money is a useless thing in itself, or it's true of any kind of money. If it's made of gold and silver, it's useless in itself because you can't eat it, but so be it. Um, the idea that monetary media only have value because the rule of the state makes use of them, that comes closer to a politically uh, defined valuation. State says it's worth this much, hence you have to accept that. There's a very uh, striking, very often quoted uh, law from the Jin period, middle of the third, uh, third century um, BC, a couple decades uh, before uh, Jin had unified, uh, conquered, I should say, all of China. Uh, a, a, a law that says it's really illegal for people to make distinctions between coins based on their quality. People should accept all of our coins as if they were the same, if regardless of whether they are fine or bad. If they are high quality, worn out, heavy, light, as long as they're not counterfeit, they have to be accepted at face value. People should not try to differentiate between them and all kinds of harsh penalties are attached uh, to this, as in all the gin laws. They're like very harsh uh, penalties. Now, whenever you see something like this, the most plausible explanation, interpretation is not everybody does that. The most plausible explanation is there's a real problem. People do, in fact, in real life, differentiate between good and bad coins because that's what people do, and that's why you need these harsh laws to crack down on this. So we can't really take this at face value. At the same time, as is well known, in the Roman tradition, for instance, you get similar ideas. Yes, in real life, people are very interested in how much gold and silver a coin contains, but technically, it's not a commodity. It's a normed uh, object. Coins should be counted, not weighed. If they're not counterfeit, they have to be accepted, regardless of the conditions. Uh, all these things are actually very, very similar to what the Chinese state uh, told its own people. So in that sense, the difference isn't really all that great, in as much as there is any difference at all. It's just in modern scholarship, the fiduciary dimension of Chinese coinage tends to be more emphasized uh, compared uh, to at least traditional scholarship on um, uh, the Western, the Roman tradition. Doesn't really make a lot of sense. If you look at the actual evidence, it's quite clear that the Chinese authorities from early on paid a lot of attention to the physical properties of the coins they issued. The Jin Ban Liang coin is called the half ounce coin for a reason, because it weighs half an ounce. So if you didn't care about the physical properties of coins, you wouldn't call them half ounce coins. And initially, uh, this weight is quite scrupulously maintained. They are only developed later uh, in the course of the fourth century as Jin mounts bigger and bigger wars to conquer all its neighbors. It's in that context that you find the injunction against discriminating against good and bad coins. And you find a statement like this one in the early Han period that after the Jin period, where lots of Jin coins are still in circulation, well, there's a great deal of unevenness. There are some places where there are more good coins and some places where there are more worse coins. And that really throws people off. And they don't accept the lightweight, the inferior coins at face value. So if the price is 100 cash and you give someone 100 underweight cash coins for the transaction, they're going to say, we need an extra 10 because these coins are no good, right? You have to make up the difference. Uh, if they are heavier than usual, it makes things even more difficult because it would really interfere with any kind of market transactions because then people wouldn't want to part with their overweight coins and all kinds of problems would ensue. And it was certainly already recognized uh, in the early Han period. And that's part of the reason why the central government in the late second century BC decides to uh, centralize uh, the whole process to manufacture coins that are not just ideally, but also in practice uh, uh, cast on a very specific standard. And we see this, if you look at samples uh, of these uh, early coins, very early on, the first few years when they were introduced, the target weight is about here. And you see that most coins were heavier than they needed to be. Which makes a lot of sense if you want to give the new system a leg up. You want to demonstrate that these coins are really good coins um, and um, to make, you know, induce people uh, to accept them. I've done like Gresham's laws would kick in and people would hoard them and so on. It didn't work particularly well. So after a few years, they figure out that's not a very good idea. We have to produce these coins really on the precise weight standard. And what you get as a result is essentially a bell curve. Some coins are lighter, some are heavier, but the target weight 
uh, is very clear, and the manufacturers aim deliberately uh, um, for um, uh, meeting, uh, uh, converging on this particular um, target weight. If the weight of the coin hadn't mattered, it would have been unnecessary uh, to make these efforts. Well, you have a short intermediate period of usurpation for 20 years. The Han Dynasty is restored in the early first century AD. The Eastern Han Dynasty, they bring back the Wuzhou system. They say officially everything is the way it used to be as before. But if you look at the weight distribution, it's the same bell curve, but has shifted 15% to the left. Now, on average, all these coins are 15% less heavy than they were before, but they're still officially five grain coins. But the weight system hadn't changed as far as we know in the meantime. So five grains should still have been 3.4 grams and not like 2.8. But that's what you could get away with. You couldn't get away with introducing pure token coins, but you could engage in some manipulation uh, on, on a rather more modest scale. Now I should say, this sounds very sort of, I don't know, self-congratulatory. I found this out about a decade ago. And when I talked about this to you know, numismatic scholars in Beijing and other places in China, they were really surprised. They would say, why would you weigh all these coins and then compare their weight systematically? Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> There's still a lot of work to be done. So I'm, I'm sure work has been done in the meantime. But I was really surprised that there weren't really any studies being done uh, along these lines, which I think would be pretty standard uh, in um, studying uh, Western coins. And you can see the shift here. Uh, the mean weight of the Western Han coins corresponds very closely to what they should be. And then in the Eastern Han period, they are about 15% uh, percent lower on average. So the state does pay attention. The state wouldn't have had to pay attention had people not cared. It should have been irrelevant what these coins weighed. If they were purely fiduciary, people should have accepted them anyway. Same is true of metal content, which is not easy uh, for people to find out as we all know, but the state cares and apparently people care even about this. So in good times, and there are not many analyses out there available, but again, number is growing. In good times, the state made sure that the bronze content was very high, that the lead content wasn't more than say 10 or 20% of a coin. In bad times, you get coins that are very lead heavy, that are half lead or more than half. Uh, lead, which I guess if you put in a very large amount of lead, people will eventually notice because the coin gets soft and you can probably tell uh, in various ways. So again, that's something you don't do unless you absolutely have to, unless there are strong uh, fiscal pressures. Again, if those had been fiduciary issues, nobody would have cared about the material. They could have been manufactured in, in copper, in bronze, in iron, in lead, shouldn't have made any difference, but it clearly makes uh, a lot of difference to people on the ground. At the same time, actual token coinages, which were experimented with from time to time, clearly did not uh, work. One of the most famous episodes is during the Wang Mang uh, usurpation between uh, after 7 or 9 uh, AD, when someone who does not belong to the Han lineage uh, comes to power, usurps the throne, isn't very successful, he dies and Han are restored after a couple of decades, but it's an interstitial period uh, right in the middle uh, of the Han Dynasty. And what Mang Mang does, well, he needs a lot of money because in a usurper, he has to suppress this content, he has to buy people off, he has to wage new wars, he has to do all kinds of expensive things. And so he comes up with this very clever idea of issuing token coins. He says, let's get rid of the Wuzhu coins. We now have new coins which are worth much more. They happen to look pretty much the same. They're the same size, the same weight, but they are five times as valuable. Or 25 times. Imagine that. So all of a sudden the government can pay, uh, uh, um, you know, purchase many more goods and services using the same amount of metal. And people are not happy. And there's a whole literary tradition talking about how people resist uh, these issues, that people have been forced uh, to use them, to own them. There are checkpoints, supposedly checking if people own enough of these coins. Uh, all kinds of unrest, heavy penalties are imposed on people who reject these coins, forge these coins. Uh, then when he needs even more money, he uh, brings back the spade and the knife coins in a very miniaturized form. Uh, these coins are overvalued by thousands of percent relative to in their intrinsic value. That lasts exactly seven years, so it's clearly very unsuccessful. It's something that wasn't just made up by hostile sources. Wang Mang is a failed usurper. 
So once he had been removed, the Eastern Han sources only have bad things to say about him. Mm. They say, this was really terrible. This is the stupidest idea ever, and people hated this, and so on. So we have to take it with a grain of salt. But we do find quite a few of those objects. So they were actually churned out in large quantities. There was a really ambitious attempt by the government to impose a token coin system on a empire of 50 million people, and it didn't work. It was rescinded already in his lifetime after only seven years because people would just reject uh, this idea. And we have similar episodes in the period of disunion uh, in between the Han and Tang dynasties where uh, very ephemeral states try to shore up the fiscal capacity by again churning out highly developed coins. And it just really doesn't work. Uh, the idea is that you can cut corners, you can save uh, copper, and work by making these less valuable objects and claim they're worth as much as before. They're lighter in weight, but greater in quantity. That just doesn't work. Uh, this creates a, a great deal of evils, a great deal of popular uh, resistance. And of course, when paper money is introduced in the Song and the Mongol uh, period, eventually it runs into the same difficulties. Uh, the moment it's no longer uh, meaningfully backed up by copper and other precious metal uh, reserves, you have runaway inflation as you would if you just keep on printing banknotes uh, in order to meet uh, government uh, expenditure needs. That's not going to work extremely well either. And so the Ming Dynasty effectively uh, curbs this and is very happy when the Spanish silver uh, comes in from the New World because for the first time it puts the economy on a more solid basis. So overall, over 2,000 years, there is no really good evidence that the Chinese were somehow, as if by magic, more accepting of fiduciary or token coinages than people uh, elsewhere in the old world. So in a way, there was a great deal of, of difference between East and West in terms of the metals being used, that the Eastern system is anchored in bronze after the 16th century, the uh, uh, system in the rest of the old world anchored in gold uh, and silver. Uh, there's a great uh, difference in style in that Chinese coins never adopt pictorial images, which seem like a you know, pretty, not particularly far-fetched thing to do, but that's just um, actively shunned even in contact uh, with other civilizations to maintain uh, this particular tradition. But at the same time, when you look at how coins are being valued, that doesn't seem at least to me to have been any meaningful difference. Uh, in terms of how that was done. And that people in East and West and in between were always interested in what was inside the coin, no matter what the government was trying uh, to tell them. So you have a great deal of continuity in that regard. And that's pretty much all I have to say. So I would like to thank you for your attention and I welcome your questions.